hello everyone. Welcome to Unlocking Institutional Efficiency to Fulfill Your Mission While Reducing Overhead and Expense, part of the Higher Education Leadership Symposium presented by Dynamic Campus, the strategic technology partner for higher education since 2003. I'm David Hunter, Executive Director of Transition Services at Dynamic Campus. I'll be leading today's roundtable as we discuss how institutions are quickly identifying and eliminating overhead and expense without hampering their ability to fulfill their mission for all their stakeholders. To share some of the real world approaches small private institutions are taking today to ensure their universities are prepared to thrive no matter what the future holds, I'd like to welcome two additional leaders of higher education. Donna Nance is the Vice President of Finance and Administration at Texas Wesleyan University, a role she's held since January 2016. Donna has 20 years of experience in higher education, finance, administration, and accreditation, including senior leadership at three colleges and universities prior to Texas Wesleyan. Thanks for joining us today, Donna. Barb Sands is the Chief Financial Officer at Greenville University, having served in that position since April 2019 on an interim and now full-time basis. Previously, she was a Greenville was Greenville's controller for nearly 15 years. Welcome, Barb. Now, today, folks, we're going to cover much ground as we can in our time together, but we know we won't get to everything you're interested in. So we've set aside about 10 minutes or so at the end to answer your questions. You may also ask a question anytime during the webinar today by typing it into your Q&A window on the screen. Please note that your name will be attached to your question and it will be visible to others in attendance. If another participant asks a question that you like or would like to see answered, just click or press the thumbs up icon and we'll answer the most popular questions as time allows. So without further ado, let's dive right into our topics today, shall we? So let's start with you, Donna. Um, prior to the pandemic, how was your institution leveraging information technology to increase operational efficiency? Thank you, David. Um, prior to the pandemic, that seems like it was forever ago. <laughs> yep. um, part of, I, I would say the two probably main things that we were doing to leverage um, IT to increase operational efficiency was one, is that we spent a lot of time reviewing um, IT contracts and eliminating redundant services. And by doing that, we created some budget savings that we were able to use to upgrade computers, servers, or other kind of IT equipment. Um, the, the other thing um, that we were able to do is we really took advantage of um, doing some business process analysis and um, we've done that in several areas on campus. We've done it in financial aid, um, student accounts, human resources, and the registrar's office. And that, those analyses have allowed us to really take a look at how best we can use the system. We're on um, the Lucia and colleague system and allowed us to automate processes and kind of redesign some of our processes to become more efficient. And so it's an ongoing process. Um, some have been uh, uh, smoother uh, than others. I think change uh, is always difficult, um, but it has definitely resulted in um, better and more efficient processes. Okay. Thanks. What, do you, what have you done, Barb, as you've, uh, prior to the pandemic, what were the things that you were doing at Greenville University? Um, I can share similar stories and circumstances with Donna. We just launched our partnership with Dynamic Campus in September of 2019. And so we're just completing that one year. And so it, I agree, the pandemic seems like it was forever ago. But prior to that, even, we were operating in a lot of silos. So each department kind of had their own way of doing things, own structure, separate systems. And then we started going through the business process analysis with Dynamic Campus. And we've completed those with admissions, marketing, financial aid, registrar's office, finances in January. I'm really looking forward to that, by the way. And so there was a lot of redundancies, similar reports being run even in offices next to one another. 
and no one had any idea that was happening. And so kind of removing some of those processes and automating more, we discovered some of our systems weren't even set up correctly and we're Genzibar EX users. And so we really partnered with our IT team with Dynamic Campus to get some of that set up. That's still in progress. And so it's not totally completed, but we're working through it. And I would say there's a lot more collaboration among departments, just understanding the why we're doing what we're doing was very important. And as Donna alluded to with change, it is difficult, but I think if you can help them understand the process, the reasoning, no one's losing their job, you know, because we're streamlining processes, it's you need to help us get to the next step to help us further our mission, our mission and help keep those operating expenses under control. And so we were able to negotiate a lot of contracts and use some of those operating expenses toward other technology needs that we were lacking in. Great, thank you. I, you know, I saw a common thread among both of your answers. It, it seemed like uh, improving your efficiency didn't necessarily mean spending more money. It was more uh, utilizing what you had in a better way. Um, and I think that's great. And that really kind of leads us into our next question. Uh, as, as the pandemic hit, we started prior to the pandemic, but now the pandemic hit um, in the spring and has had a real impact on the fall. And so specifically during this challenging fall term, have you been able to reduce operating expenses through if, effective use of information technology and maybe share some examples. And let's start with you, Barb. Yes, we have. We actually um, were able to partner with another university who had um, discovered uh, saliva testing for COVID. And so we tried to determine, okay, who's going to be our COVID response team? What kind of teams do we need? What kind of technology are we going to need? And so we were informed that it was going to be around the $60,000 cost just for an ERP system because they felt we needed a separate one. Well, we took that information to the Dynamic Campus team and they began leveraging with Genzibar and um, purchased some computers, label makers, labels, all of those kinds of things for less than $5,000. So we were able to avoid additional costs there and then another example would be through some of the contract negotiation process, even last fiscal year, we were able to uh, use those savings toward the purchase of network switches. So we have, I think I was told yesterday, nearly 50 buildings or approximately 50 and there's only four left. And I know how expensive those network switches are. And so to be able to do that with nearly 2000 man hours, that's a year's worth of hours. And so thanks to the shared services team that has significantly saved the operational budget. Well, and I think that's interesting, Barb. You know, we, we talk about network, but I think the key driver to that was, I remember being on your campus and students and Wi-Fi, right? Oh my. Yep. Students, yes. uh, you know, your president, Suzanne, says, you know, you can take away their food. You can take away, you could take the sheets off their bed, not even give them a pillow. They'd be fine, but you take away their Wi-Fi or have bad Wi-Fi and you got a revolt on your hands. And, and so, yeah, it's been a fun project there. Donna, how about you specifically during this fall term? What are some of the things that, that you've done? So um, specifically, I want to talk a little bit about the, when we transitioned to being remote um, the Dynamic Campus team was instrumental in um, uh, assisting our faculty and staff uh, uh, moving to a remote um, operation, and they did that kind of on a dime, um, and, and they, they really assisted ensuring that employees could get set back up from, you know, being able to work from home um, pretty um, quickly. Um, one of the things that we... Um, uh, realized that when we did that is that we had um, a really outdated um, phone system and it was on the list of things that we needed to address that because of needing to go remote it really 
um, kind of was brought to the top of the, the list. Um, we had a very old, um, outdated end of life Cisco phone system um, that was no longer being supported. And one of the issues that we had is as people were working from, um, from home is not being able to access um, the, the phone system. And so um, uh, the IT team was able to um, uh, purchase and, and implement a new phone system, a 3CX uh, phone system, it's cloud-based, very robust in its various different functionalities. Um, and so that really helped us um, as we um, you know, continue working uh, remotely. Um, and, and it was also less expensive than what we were, um, than the phone system that we did have. And so we were able to use some of those savings to um, address some of the other issues that we were needing to address related to um, the, the pandemic. And that was to increase our internet capacity um, to be able to have um, some redundancy, a secondary pipe, not knowing exactly what kind of stresses we were gonna have on the network and our internet access. And so um, that allowed us to be um, uh, ready for the fall semester. We also um, increased our um, storage um, capacity. And so um, to, to be able to withstand some of the stresses that we anticipated having on the system when the fall semester started. Wow, those are both great examples. Thanks for sharing, ladies. You know, it's interesting and, um, you know, increasing uh, you know, things and not necessarily spending more money. But you talked, Donna, specifically about um, how we, you know, you flipped almost on a dime to help faculty mm -hmm. switch and prepare um, to go online. And that, that brings up our next question, which is, you know, we made this switch almost overnight to a remote learning environment where we had to have students not in the classroom. So leading into this next question, we helped the faculty, but can you share some examples of how your use of information technology helped promote student engagement? We know that going remote learning can be less engaging. And so that's a very critical topic as we, we consider the environment in which we're in. Do you have any examples you could share of that? Sure. So, you know, for us at uh, Texas Wesleyan, it was um, really important that we provide some flexibility to students in their um, in the instructional delivery as we um, started preparing for the fall semester. And that it really wasn't going to be a one size fits all, that we felt very adamant about needing to provide what we call a hybrid, high flex um, instructional method. So that would include um, students who wanted to continue to come to school in a face-to-face -face, um, modality. It included being able to, to um, allow students to um, uh, continue their education through um, a synchronous uh, modality or asynchronous modality. Um, Students, you know, at given this time are all dealing with various different um, situations. And so um, obviously we're all in a situation where enrollment <laughs> is everything. And so we really needed to provide um, uh, the, uh, an ability for students to, to work, continue their education in whatever manner that they needed at that time. And so that really created... Um, some very complex situations for us to deal with. Um, we were able to identify, kind of, um, kind of take over some additional space on campus that was no longer going to be used um, that allowed us to expand our classroom capacity to ensure that we provided the social distancing that was necessary for those students who wanted to continue coming face to face. But then while doing that, we needed to um, uh, provide the additional equipment in the classrooms so that they, we have the appropriate technology to be able to provide the synchronous or the asynchronous um, virtual environment for our students. And um, Dynamic Campus was able to, um, to help us uh, identify what uh, classroom needs we had and what equipment we needed to, to purchase. That way we, we felt like regardless of what situation a student was in, we were able to provide um, a, a, a way for them to continue their education. Um, we also 
um, really rolled out um, Microsoft Teams. Um, I think there were maybe a few offices on campus that had already started using Teams, but for the most part, nobody knew what Teams was, um, much less using it as much as we do in today's environment. So um, Dynamic Campus was able to assist us in rolling that out. And we, so I mentioned earlier that there are some services that we offer um, that are continuing to come to campus and offer those services um, face to face, but we also needed to be able to provide services in a virtual manner. So um, whether they're meeting with financial aid or student accounts or student affairs, um, students have the ability to use Teams um, to, to reach out to the various different offices. Um, student affairs also continued offering some of the events that they normally would do in a face-to-face -face manner, but used um, either Teams or Zoom to have various different events, whether they were um, you know, game nights or um, other kinds of events that they would do. And, and I, surprisingly, we had quite a few um, participants probably not as many as we would have if it was in a face-to-face, -face, but students really engaged um, to get advantage of those opportunities. So Great. those are just Thanks. a few examples. Great. Barb, how about you at Greenville? What are some of the, can you share some examples of how you used information technology to promote that student engagement? Yes, we currently use um, an app called Presence and that actually helps we started doing a little bit of research on this prior to dynamic campus but i will say they are so responsive to any issues that we've had but it helps um, track students in their activities what they're choosing to participate in and some of that that way if we see a student is beginning to isolate themselves or not participate like they have been you know, the last thing we want is a student to be alone in a dorm. That's one thing I think this pandemic has created is just a lot of loneliness. And um, so I think it's very important that we reach out and try to engage those students the best of our ability. And so that app really helps with that. And then we also use an early alert system. And so any faculty or staff member that sees any type of problem or potential issue with a student you know, maybe it's um, grade related or just notice a difference in um, personality, any of that, they can issue a ticket in the early alert system and that goes to specific individuals that can then reach out to that student and have those conversations, um, find out what's going on. We've also established several different licenses for Zoom during this pandemic. Um, of course, we use that in the classroom, mm -hmm. especially now uh, some students that didn't come back after the Thanksgiving break that opted for the remote and distance learning option. The faculty are using both Zoom and a face-to-face -face experience for those students. So just trying to keep them engaged. We had a lot of faculty even in the spring reaching out to students and, and not just faculty. I mean, there were a lot of administrative staff members and staff reaching out to students just to make sure they were engaged. We literally used Zoom, Facebook, um, FaceTime, all of those technology efforts um, to try to keep those students engaged. You know, we felt it was a huge retention um, gain and even uh, a use to attract students. We marketed our saliva testing, you know, through the summer when we knew we were gonna be able to offer that and so I think that that appealed to parents that, you know, Greenville was a safe environment for their child. And so again, without dynamic campus in those efforts, we would never have been able to provide anything remotely close to this. Great, those are great examples. I've got two questions in the Q and A that are pertinent to this question. So I wanna ask some follow-ups. So this one I think goes, probably you mentioned this Donna about engaging and using using classrooms better. This question comes from Daniel De Leon. Did IT add instructional media in new spaces during the COVID environment? Yes, they did. Um, and in some areas were a little bit easier than others, but yes, um, there was additional um, equipment, media equipment that was put in those classrooms. Okay, great. Barb, did they, I think it's good to ask for Greenville as well, did 
did Greenville add additional media in any of the classrooms to, to help during this time? That's a great question. I'm not sure I fully know the answer to that. I We had a lot of smart classrooms already that we were utilizing. I do know that our Center for Teaching and Learning, which is under you know our IT staff, did a lot of work um, to help because in the spring, there were several faculty members that had never taught an online class. I mean, we offer some online platforms. However, there was a lot of coaching and educating and just uh, teaching them how to use you know, the resources available. How do I utilize Zoom in a classroom setting or how do I teach online? And so they were instrumental in offering um, tutorials. They conducted videos and showed screenshots along the way. They met with individuals personally. Um, so of course, you know, we purchased a license, but I, I honestly don't have an answer for you on the technology that we had to purchase. Good. If we did, it was a very minimal amount because I would have seen large amounts come through the budget. Yeah, perfect. Well, and this the second fault question actually is for you, Barb. You brought up the the presence app, and Patrick McAvoy asked. He said, "What kinds of metrics and presence are you using to measure engagement outside the classroom?" Um, so, a student can swipe. I think this is how it works. A student can. Um, they can download it on their smartphone and then those activities. So our calendar is in there and each activity. So each person that would be in charge of that activity can set that up on the mm -hmm. app. So as a student logs in, it tracks that they are there. And so we will know, of course, there are no athletic competitions currently this fall, but it would tell them if they showed up at a basketball game or if they showed up for Vespers, which is an alternative to chapel, it will show them if they, you know, arrived at chapel, you know. Um, and, and so any type of uh, community life activity or event that goes on, you know, anywhere from homecoming to commencement to, um, you know, any, any kind of ice cream social or any extra activity. Perfect. So really, you can really show, I guess, presence is really what it is. You know, they're present, almost right. kind of like an attendance tracker, but more versus uh, here or present, it's um, I'm participating in some activity or something. Yes. That's great. Well, let's move on to the next question. Um, and this question goes out to um, Donna. Are there any specific challenges you've faced during this rapid digital transformation? Um, I, I would say one of the, the biggest challenges was just the speed of change um, and, and needing to know that we needed to change, but not necessarily know the answer. Um, you know, we were kind of um, uh, figuring it out as we went. Um, and one of the things that was really critical to what I believe our success was of being able to, to um, be operational in the fall was that we had two different task force. We had a, what we call a return to campus task force that was more staff um, related. And then we had a task force that was really made up of um, faculty that, um, that was you know, discussing all the classroom uh, challenges. And um, our CIO, um, Daniel, he was part of both of those task force and really um, provided um, a lot of great input and, and, and from a technology perspective, the things that we needed to, to address. Um, you know, I kind of already talked about kind of the, the, what we ended up with trying to not have one um, kind of instructional delivery method, but trying to offer options to students. Um, and that made it more difficult because it's not like we could just um, say, okay, here are the changes for this particular um, option, but we needed to provide three options to students. And I think that just made it a little bit more complicated. Um, but um, I, I think in the end, it, it has been very successful. Um, and, and I think students appreciate the ability to, to um, choose whatever modality they needed um, at the moment. Yeah, great. Barb, how about you? Are there any specific challenges that you think Greenville faced during this digital transformation? I would agree with the rapid pace of change. 
And even uh, when, you know, trying to determine what do we do? Do we open? Do we close? Do we do only remote? All of that. Um, and as we all know, the CDC guidelines were changing what seemed like every minute or at least every hour on the hour. So we established three different teams of response. So we had a team called protect them, one called host them and one called teach them. And so there were specific uh, staff members and faculty associated with each one of those and they had specific tasks. And of course the teach them really focused on the technology needs that would um, have to be established. And as I stated earlier, coaching and educating those faculty members who had never taught in an online platform before. And then uh, with giving those students an option to return after Thanksgiving or stay at home for remote learning, because we only have two weeks, of course, less than that now left in the semester. And roughly 200 of them chose to stay home. And so then it's, how do I finish my labs in uh -huh. an online uh, option? And then what if I only have one student in the classroom and then there's 14 on Zoom, how does that work? And so I think one thing we've all learned how to do is to become adaptable. And I would say that's not in my top five strengths on the Gallup, you know, 34 strengths finder. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so it's probably a good thing I'm not a faculty member in the classroom. And, uh, but I can only imagine the stress level of all of that and trying to, you know, how do I grade papers online and how do, how does that all work? And how do I engage a student in an online class? And what if they continue to not show up? What about the students in quarantine? What about those in isolation? How do they get caught up? What kind of accommodations do I need to make? And so, you know, all those can be related to the technology needs and the challenges, you know, that we face. And so as those things change, we just have to be adaptable. And I just really appreciate the innovation and the quick responses that we get from Dynamic Campus, because if we don't have the staff here on campus to handle that, Shared services is a phone call away, and they are there to help through many of these issues that we faced. Good. Well, and that brings up to mind um, a couple follow-up questions I want to ask both of you ladies. Um, first of all, and you mentioned this, Barb, sometimes you don't always have the resources you need to get it done. So what advice would both of you give to leaders who want to make changes to transform their institution and become more efficient, but maybe the culture is a little bit resistant to this limited resources and making those sorts of changes. Is there any advice you would give? And uh, we'll start uh, start with you, Donna. Um, you know, I, I think I would advise maybe finding what I call some low hanging fruit. Right, you got to get some small wins early on um, that perhaps are maybe with the office or group that is a little bit more <clears throat> ready to make change um, and kind of use those um, as, as the example of here's what we can do and where you can um, talk about um, the success and what, what the improvement was. Um, and, and I think Barb mentioned this earlier, it's about reassuring people it's not about um, eliminating jobs there, there's always more work to be done. It's about how can we um, work smarter, not harder, um, especially in, in, in today's time. Um, but I, I would say try to find some low hanging fruit, you know, and use those as, as some, some easy wins. Great, thanks Donna. How about you, Barb? I would agree with that. And I would also add, we all have influencers on our campus. And I think those are key people to bring into those conversations that can help message things correctly. I know for our institution, when we started having those conversations, um, even, even after we signed the contract and you know we, we knew we were going this direction, we called in some of the key users of our ERP and just said, you know, you know, that list of things that we've never been able to do. Well, guess what? 
we're now going to be able to do them. You know, I mean, we've, we've been given, I, I want to call it the easy staples button with <laughs> dashboards. And I mean, I've never been able to push a button before and get instant results. It's how many reports do you get to print? And then you, you know, save them in, a, in an Excel format. And then you begin to manipulate and pivot tables right and left. And we're not doing that anymore. And so I, I feel like calling in those key leaders to help message the change and spin it in a positive manner has really made a difference. And I think that is just crucial for anyone looking um, at the opportunity to partner with Dynamic Campus. That is, um, I, I think the messaging is 100%, but those key influencers um, help make that process go a lot smoother. Great. Thank you both for your comments. And one additional follow-up question on this topic of digital transformation. We talked a lot about how, how it affected, impacted faculty. And I think sometimes we, we need to remember it impacts students prior to making them, you know, this new environment where only a portion could come on campus and maybe, you know, it was very limited. Students used to could come onto campus if they needed computers or whatever. But we often forget that there are students out there who don't have a computer at home or don't Maybe they have a cell phone, but it's, you know, it's a basic one. They, you know, how have you, each of you faced challenges with the students with this rapid trans, uh, transformation? You know, it could either be equipment at home, internet access, or are there challenges you've seen there and how have you faced those? Let's start off with uh, Greenville. We um, had a lot of extra information that we could send out to students. There were uh, a lot of different internet companies offering different internet packages at either a reduced cost or free for a, you know, a limited number of hours during the day. And so they were sent those links. Again, we had, you know, faculty and staff contacting students to make sure they had everything they needed. We actually uh, set up and established a, what was called a Deacon's Fund, kind of a benevolence fund. And so students with hardships you know, that had to purchase some of that equipment. We had some uh, music majors, audio engineering, you know, that it's specific. So I know that Dynamic Campus, you, the students were allowed to contact them and they would help them with um, trying to determine what kind of program maybe they needed on their own computer or where to get that information. Um, we helped some students purchase some of that equipment through that Deacons Fund. And so, it, I think that spoke volumes, you know, not only to the campus, but especially to the students and the parents that we cared that much that the students would get the experience that, you know, they had hoped to gain through a four-year education. Even in the midst of a pandemic, we didn't, there's already enough hardships on them, you know, with, like I said earlier, the loneliness, you know, that a pandemic can bring. And so that just, those were just additional ways that we cared you know, and can provide some of those resources for those families. Great. Those are wonderful examples. Donna, did you, did you see any of these challenges at Texas Wesleyan? Obviously Greenville is more of a, a rural uh, community, Texas Wesleyan, you're in a very metropolitan area. What sort of challenges did you see with students in the digital transformation and, and do you have any examples? Yeah, uh, we experienced something very similar. We had students that either didn't have the technology at all um, or didn't have um, the right kind of technology. And um, our dynamic campus team worked with students, um, helped them identify what it was that they needed. Um, in some cases, um, the university was able to um, provide loaner uh, equipment. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> dynamic campus was able to facilitate that for students. We also had students and employees who had connectivity issues, either um, the student may not have had internet access or maybe the internet access that we had um, wasn't sufficient. Um, and so they really facilitated um, getting hotspots uh, out to either an employee or to students to help them get connected. Um, and so from, from that perspective, you know, the, the um, kind of the help desk, so to speak, really kind of changed gears a little bit to really um, helping students and employees figure out 
you know, it, it, are, are they having issues? Is it our connectivity issues or is it their connectivity issues? You know, they, they really help um, kind of do some research of some uh, local um, internet provider, service providers and was able to have that information available to students. We were kind of in the same situation that some of those service providers were providing special discounts or even some free services um, for a limited time due to the pandemic. Um, uh, so um, that was instrumental. It, it seems as if that was more um, in relation to the transition to remote um, an environment back in March than it was at the beginning of the fall semester, but we probably had some of that too in the fall semester. Great. Those are great examples. Thank you both for sharing those. Let's jump into the next question, um, which is our last question. And then we've got quite a few stacking up in the Q&A that we'll have time to answer. Um, based upon what you've learned this year, how do you see information technology being used to reshape higher education? And let's start with you, Barb, this time. I think one thing uh, we could all agree on is our reliance on technology. And I think we realized that even before the pandemic, I mean, we're, I think I read one time where uh, by the time a student is a senior, what they, the technology they use their freshman year is completely outdated. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm sure, and that was a number of years ago, so I'm sure that has changed. It's probably by the time you're a senior, what you had as a junior is probably outdated. And we all know that there's no way we would have that remote learning option without technology. But I'm gonna go back to the dashboards again. And if, we, if we're really evaluating and analyzing those programs and what we think are profitable, just because there's a full classroom does not mean that there's profit being generated for that. And, I, you know, I remember last summer prior to Dynamic Campus coming, I spent six weeks analyzing programs through manipulated data and combining spreadsheets and those pivot tables and looking at what came through admissions and what's the demand, what are we offering uh, what programs are kind of obsolete, you know, across the nation and hoping that you didn't make a mistake in, in manual processes. And so with them coming alongside us and ensuring our systems are set up properly, the trees are all built, if you will, in Genzibar and making sure all of that data is tracked and it's in the input. Of course, that's the key. You still have a, a human, you know, inputting the data, but ensuring that that information that's going in is accurate. And as we, you know, partner with other uh, vendors, no, for what, you know, no matter what the subject matter is, it's just ensuring that that's all correct. So when we are pressing those easy staples button, then we are getting accurate data. And so, you know, we're getting close to having that program uh, information at our fingertips and I've already got to participate in the demo of it and we're super close if not almost done and so that's going to be so nice to be able to put that on a large screen and just show faculty or staff or even board members you know this is this is what we're getting and just uh, that's going to help you know guide informative decisions for the future that we, we wouldn't otherwise have. And so I, I, I think that is key to, uh, you know, how do we know what students are, are, are wanting or what their desire is in a career if we don't, if we're not tracking that information in a proper way and then not just tracking it for the sake of tracking it, but just really analyzing that information and then doing something with it. Great, those are great. Thanks, Barb. How about you, Donna? Um, I think two things come to mind for, for us, um, you know, with us being able to transition um, to remote working or remote learning, um, you know, it kind of came to, um, to mind earlier this week, we were having a, a, a campus meeting about our inclement weather procedures. 
um, if, in the event that we needed to cancel classes because of bad weather. And of course, you know, this winter probably won't have to, but even looking forward, you know, now that we know that we can um, switch uh, to remote learning pretty quickly, you know, the whole idea of canceling classes, um, you know, in the event of any kind of um, bad weather probably uh, goes away because um, we can all learn remote these days. Um, but then the, the other thing that really comes to mind as um, the effect on higher education as a whole in this remote environment is the effects on retention. Um, that's been a big concern for us this semester. Um, <clears throat> we did um, do some initial kind of looking at when we had midterm grades as to what, how students were um, uh, doing in their classes and faculty talk about that is um, it, it, the concern because it's difficult when a student chooses definitely in an asynchronous manner um, to take their classes of, to ensure that you have the appropriate um, engagement. And so um, I, I think we probably will have a lot to learn um, when we get to the end of the semester and take a look at the success um, academic success that students have had given this environment. Um, it, it, it potentially could have a very negative impact, you know, for us um, looking forward and what kind of strategies, you know, should we be putting in place, giving our remote um, nature um, that would re-engage students um, in, back in the classroom. Great. Thank you both for sharing those. You both have uh, just great examples. And I think we can all say we've all learned a lot, um, even outside of higher education. Uh, people have learned to work remotely, to learn remotely and do those things. We've got a uh, plethora of questions in our Q&A um, that I think we should have plenty of time to get to most of them. Um, the most popular one out here comes from Patrick again. Um, he asks Barb, he says, Barb, can you elaborate on the saliva test that you mentioned and how are they doing that this semester? So I know you mentioned that it was very early on. Um, tell us a little bit about how that developed and how, how it's working. And sure. uh, Our president, uh, Suzanne Davis, uh, is friends with the president at the University of Illinois in Champaign. And one of their vice presidents was key, was very instrumental in developing the saliva test. And so they established the lab on, on site at their campus and we partnered with them. And so students and staff are tested twice weekly. And those results are, I mean, you literally spit or drool I think our slogan at the time was it's cool to drool. And so that sal those saliva test tubes are taken to champagne every evening. And then those results, results are given to us the next morning. So we're able to isolate and quarantine very quickly. I feel our numbers have been uh, fairly low because of that. And even some of the students that did test positive were already in a quarantine situation. So we've been able to keep that very much under control. And we, you know, deployed and set it all up. We blocked off a section of our dining hall area because we were having to reduce the amount of space in there. Of course, in the beginning of the fall semester, we couldn't even have inside dining. So we had tents set up all over campus for the student experience. So it's kind of nice to see them at least engaging somewhat and the weather cooperated much longer than normal. And so that was a blessing in disguise, but yeah, the, the testing has gone rather well. We have had zero complaints. Those are tracked um, through the system. As I stated earlier with Dynamic Campus, able to set that all up for us, uh, working very rapidly to get that established. And so, it, I think students were so excited to be back on campus and they could leave the house, you know, after being stuck since March that I, I just don't think there were any problems. I think the staff and faculty have been very grateful and appreciative. Of course, it's no cost to the students. It's no cost to the faculty or staff. We're taking on those costs as, as an institution. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's gone extremely well. Very appreciative of our partnership with them. Well, and it was interesting. I, I remember reading 
that you actually got the testing active and off the ground before the University of Illinois did. We, we did. We were kind of their case study when people were asking them, hey, how are you doing this? And they're like, we're not doing it well. You need to go talk to Greenville because they're the ones doing it well. But our students were kind of obeying our rules. They were wearing their masks and staying socially distant where I think uh, the University of Illinois students were still gathering in large groups. And so their, their positive cases kind of were a little bit higher than they anticipated in the, in the beginning. So, yeah. Great. Thanks I think for we were even mentioned, I think we were even mentioned in Congress on the, oh, wow. on the floor. Mm -hmm. Good for you. That good publicity for Greenville. This question really kind of goes out uh, to both of you ladies. Um, it comes from Wayne Robin. He says, with tighter technology budgets due to the impacts of the pandemic, what are your priorities for the using use of available funds? And maybe we can start with Donna. Um, I would say the priorities are going to be, you know, what's going to have the biggest student impact? Um, uh, definitely the priority um, from uh, an impact on the classroom or access to um, uh, technology from a student's perspective were going to be our biggest uh, priorities. Um, and then it kind of goes out from there, you know, um, from the, um, the next wave after students are probably from a faculty or staff perspective of um, is it something that's needed in order to um, operate in our new environment. Um, uh, so I, I would say definitely what's going to have the biggest student impact. Is probably okay. our biggest Great. How about you, Barb? I would agree with that. We're going to look at what is the greatest impact to our students first, and then what technology needs maybe do we have in the classroom if we would have to go to a complete remote learning environment again, or even, you know, offer an option, a face-to-face -face or remote. What are, what are those needs? Connectivity issues. Donna mentioned those earlier. We had some of those same issues with uh, when we went remote in March, because many of our students were deemed non-essential. And so, you know, we had to make sure we had some VPN client, you know, issues. And so they, they had to fast and furiously work through those. And so I think those would be our priorities. Wi-Fi connectivity, you know, we've eliminated a lot of those issues with the network. I think our CIO would tell you we've had maybe handful of tickets this year compared to probably hundreds last year, especially from our international student population. And so that's been wonderful to have that uh, shored up and, and taken care of. But I, th I think that would be our list of priorities in the order. Great. So it's at the, the resounding uh, theme I saw with both of you is student, student experience comes first. So obviously funding would go there first before anywhere else. That's great. The next question comes from Sandra Nocella. She asked, and this really comes to both of you, were you able to reduce IT costs without negatively impacting students? Now that's a yes or no question, um, but maybe as, as you, maybe you can provide some examples. So let's start out with you, Barb. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the Wi-Fi experience. So the unlimited number of complaints that came in last year, and we launched eSports as well. And it's in a building on the square. And that is one of our fastest. I mean, if you want some high speed internet, you go to the smart center and there are zero complaints there. And we didn't have to reduce our IT costs to make that happen because Dynamic Campus was able to negotiate a lot of our contracts and get rid of redundancy and just get some lower prices and so there was no impact to the budget because we were able to use those savings and redirect and repurpose those funds. And so that positively impacted our students and very few complaints. And then, you know, being able to, you know, move to a remote environment um, certainly helped, but none of that had a negative impact to our budget. Wonderful. How about you, Donna? How about Texas Wesleyan? Yeah, um, very similar um, situation. Um, I, I would say that the majority of the um, IT cost reductions have come from uh, reducing or eliminating some of the IT contracts. 
And that was because of, we had redundant services. Um, and so the, the redundancy wasn't really adding anything from a student's experience, but the reduction in those contracts has allowed us to reinvest those dollars in areas where students can feel the, the positive um, nature of those um, reductions. So. That's a great answer. And that actually leads into a question by Patrick Farmer. Um, and, and it leads right into what you said, Donna. His question is, were you able to renegotiate vendor contracts that may not have been needed due to COVID? So you talked, Donna, specifically about, you know, you renegotiated contracts, but did this aspect of COVID coming in affect or maybe prompt your ability to, to do some of this renegotiation? Yeah, you know, it is, we transitioned um, with Dynamic Campus, um, <clears throat> I think it was back in 2018, seems like forever ago. Um, and, you know, that was one of the first things um, that Dynamic Campus helped us do. And, you know, some contracts you can renegotiate, sometimes you can terminate them, um, and, but sometimes you can't. And so you kind of have to let them um, run their course. And so um, it's been kind of an ongoing effort that we've had. So it wasn't necessarily related um, to, to COVID. It was just that we were able to, to take a, um, to continue to take advantage of kind of the work that had already been going um, on the taking a look at um, IT contracts. So um, the, the, the timing of it just happened to be, you know, while we were um, with COVID, dealing with COVID. Perfect. How about you, Barb? Um, has, has COVID uh, maybe increased or, or started out the renegotiation of some contracts that um, maybe you didn't need? I, if I remember correctly, I think there were at least one or two contracts that we were able to take advantage of the COVID environment um, and the different language and clauses that were in there. Um, like Donna said, though, we started some of those negotiations, you know, or Dynamic Campus did early on. And so some of those we're still trying to phase out. But I, I do think there was some leveraging due to COVID for sure. Great. Great. Next question comes from uh, Richard Middaw. He says, during these rapid changes, how do you marry enrollment and business processes with technology capability? And I might even throw in there retention. You know, I think as we look at enrollment and retention, how do you marry all of that or, or bring it together with business processes and technology capability? Um, let's start with Barb. We literally just implemented Slate. We were using Salesforce. And so we moved to a Slate platform and that has, uh, and I would say we like to do things earlier than later, you know, yesterday, not tomorrow. And so Dynamic Campus really adjusted their schedule to make that happen because we were concerned about enrollment and retention in a COVID environment. And so it was really important for us to get those up and running and all systems talking to one another and the integration piece there. And I think there were a few hiccups, but it was because of that business process analysis that they were able to take that and, you know, use that information to really push and get that implemented. And we have um, our admissions director is, from another institution that already used Slate. So she was familiar with that, which helped um, coach and guide her team through that process. But that has been very instrumental because in the past, there were too many different systems and you could call a different office and get a different headcount or different enrollment number. And now we'll all be on the same page. So that's, that's very exciting. <laughs> That's great. Donna and I both smiled, almost giggled under our breath. <laughs> different numbers from different people. Donna, what's been your experience? <laughs> well, oddly enough, we too just implemented Slate. Um, I think it went live just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so that's definitely um, a, a, a process um, for our admissions um, team to, to use to help um, hopefully assist in better recruiting and tracking as students. Um, we also... Um, just recently um, uh, completed the, the business process analysis on financial aid, where we implemented a lot of automated processes that we were doing manual um, in financial aid, like auto packager and offer letters. 
And so those have been automated, which has really assisted in our, you know, uh, uh, remote work um, and dealing with students more remotely than we do uh, face to face. Um, the other thing that I think we did that we've done um, that we've gotten some really good feedback from students, our uh, prospective students, um, is our orientation process. You know, orientation was very much of a face-to-face -face, um, uh, uh, day that students would spend, you know, working with various different departments on campus. And we moved that online and we did that with teams. And the, the feedback that we got from students is that it was very positive and they felt like they really got some individualized attention because they kind of got um, kind of transferred from one department to the other using teams. And so um, I think that's worked very well for us too. Great. Well, we, ladies, we have just time for one more quick question and any closing remarks you have. The question comes from Chad Johnson. He says, he's talking about all these initiatives and things you've talked about. He says, were many of these initiatives done just for COVID or were some of these already on your future plans, but accelerated? And let's start with uh, you, Donna. Um, I would say the, the expansion of um, classroom space, um, that would obviously be done just because of the, the pandemic. But um, things like replacing our phone system, it was on the list of things to do. It definitely got moved to the top of the list given the pandemic. Um, the transition um, or the implementation of Slate, um, it was on the list. Um, and so I'm just glad that we were able to continue to do it, um, even though we were still dealing with some of the impacts of, um, of the pandemic. So it's been kind of a mix. Okay, great. How about you, Barb? I would say ours is probably a mix. I mean, network switches, absolutely, that was on the list, some of those things. But I would say Slate probably got pushed a little bit higher on the priority list due to the pandemic, just just because of the concern with enrollment and retention in this uh, environment that we're, we're living in. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would say pretty much a mix. Great. Well, I just want to sincerely thank both of you ladies for joining us today. We've covered a lot of, uh, a lot of ground on unlocking institutional efficiency while still fulfilling your mission. Um, so it looks like we're out of time. And again, thank you so much, Donna and Barb, for joining me and sharing your real world case studies and approaches as well as with all of us in the higher education as we are seeking to fulfill our missions to be more efficient and effective. Uh, thank you both. As we touched at the top of the program, Dynamic Campus has underwritten the production of this roundtable session and the Higher Education Leadership Symposium. This virtual event offers three more free roundtables coming up over the next two days, just like this one, focused on recruiting and retention, transforming into the campus of the future, and how to thrive as a faith-based institution today. To find more out about these, you can go to dynamiccampus.com, and uh, as you see the link here on the screen, and click on the green banner at the top of the page. Thanks again, everyone, for your participation today, and we wish all of you a safe, healthy, and successful spring semester. Have a great afternoon.